Boom, we're live. This is Tio with the Arcane Bear. We have another wonderful guest. This is Dean Raiden. And correct me if I'm wrong here with some of this, but you're the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. You start uh, as a concerto violinist around the age of five, um, studying music. You then moved into science um, after learning the electrical engineering trade. Uh, you graduated magna cum laude with honors in, in physics, and then you became a master's in electrical engineering with a PhD in psychology. Did I get that all right? That's right. It's, yeah, it's a, a brilliant lead-in. Um, so, how are you doing today, Dean Raiden? Welcome to the show. I'm doing well. Uh, we, as you know, the climate is changing. It's making what what used to be winter, spring, and I have seasonal allergies. So here we are at the tail end of winter, and I'm already feeling the allergies. Uh, you know, it's, it's always good to to move it up, sh uh, shift things around. I was in Panama the other day, and I saw hail. Uh, coming down at the equator, I was I was quite surprised. Your, your things are changing very fast. Yep. Um, so one of the one of the things that, that has drawn us to the work that you do is uh, I work we work in a disruptive field. There's all these changes going on. So just to start off, would you want to kind of lead everyone in, into uh, your background and, and uh, the work that you do? Well, I'm interested in forms of human experience that challenge our our current understanding of the nature of consciousness. So if, if you, and all this has to do with uh, who and what are we, essentially. That's the truth of the question. And if you ask most scientists, or especially within the neurosciences, uh, who are you? The typical response is you are your brain. And that's the end of the sentence. You, you and the brain are exactly the same thing. And this comes about because of uh, a lot of research showing that there's certainly a correlation between your thoughts and your sense of self and your perception and all that stuff that goes on inside your head and brain activity. So some of it is completely true. But as we, we learned very early in, in the science world, uh, that correlation doesn't imply causation. We don't know which direction the, the arrow is, of causation is pointing. So... The prevailing idea in science is that brain causes mind, but I'm interested in phenomena that suggest that that's not true. And so the, the, the types of effects that are most closely uh, challenging or most challenging to the prevailing viewpoint is our psychic phenomena. So if somebody has a, a feeling of mental connection with somebody at a distance, and by distance, I mean you, they're not within the range of the ordinary senses. If that turns out to be true, then it's very difficult to sustain the idea that brain and mind are identical. That there must be something different going on with mind that the brain is not able to do. So that's one of the motivations for studying unusual experiences. The other one is that if you talk to people around the world and you don't use words like psychic or mystical, you just talk to them about the nature of their experiences and you then ask them things like, have you ever had an intuitive hunch of something that you had no reason to expect or to believe or anything, but you just felt something to be true in your gut? Almost everybody says yes at some point. If you then start probing that, you say, well, did you ever feel that you you were in connection with somebody at a distance, you had a feeling about them at a distance and it turned out later that you were correct, most people will say yes. And you can do this for every form of psychic experience. So then it raises the question, well, is that true? What are they talking about? Is it coincidence? How do we even begin to understand those kinds of questions? And so the kind of research that I do and my colleagues do as well around the world is to answer these questions. Is it real? How do we know that it's real? And what are the implications if in fact these kinds of phenomena are real? Yeah, so we're already into some very esoteric and abstract lines of thinking, which is um, exactly some of the reasons that uh, drove me to follow my particular path. You could call it an in intuitive hunch. Um, but as a, as a disruptive thinker, whether they're entrepreneurs or scientists uh, such as yourself, how did, what, what kind of pushed you to the fringe of, of your studies to start to look at these more abstract and, and esoteric questions? Uh, two things. One is that uh, I'm simply curious. <laughs> about lots of things. And so what could be more curious than uh, one of the themes that drives something like 80% of the entertainment industry? 
right? You look at, at movies, at television, at novels, uh, at the top of the list in terms of what is sold and what, what people see in the movies, they all have, have themes to do with superpowers, with psychic abilities. Sometimes it goes into a horror genre. People are fascinated by these topics and the, the topics all revolve around the idea of what are we capable of? So who's not interested in that? <laughs> Everybody's interested in it. But it turns out that within science, there's an enormous pressure to not pay attention to this topic. So it is extremely disruptive from to work on these topics within within science using scientific methods. So that's so one reason, as I said, is simply curiosity. Uh, the other one is that I think it's very important for for the following reason. The way that the economy works, the way that civilization works, it rests to a large degree on who and what we think we are. So if the prevailing view says that we're basically machines made out of meat and there's no inherent meaning about the universe or ourselves or anything, it's like a, we live in a nihilistic, pointless universe. That's what most students are taught. And so from that perspective, uh, if you, you do some kind of a financial uh, trick that throws a thousand people out of work, what difference does it make? It's all machinery. There's no meaning other than maybe he who wins with the, the most toys or he, he who has the most toys wins when they die. Uh, so th all this idea comes about from the notion of a pointless universe, a mechanistic universe. If that is in fact true and there's we're just random bits of matter and energy floating around in the universe, well, that's important to know. We have to have to deal with that in some way. But if it turns out that that's not true, that there actually is inherent meaning to, to being sentient creatures, not just human, but all sentient creatures, well, we had better figure it out. And we better figure it out fast because if you, you look at the way that, the, that civilization is growing, it's growing in a direction that is not life affirming. And so how many years do we have left? Depending on who you talk to, it's somewhere between a century, and maybe two centuries. And then even people doing the best that they can, the life will not be sustainable anymore, which is why there are plenty of folks in Silicon Valley, about 20 miles south of here, who are trying to figure out how to put us into robot bodies and how to go to Mars. Because they, you can see that the, the sustainability of the planet is in danger. So that's why it's important to know, to know better who and what we are and what we're capable of. So that's another, another motivation for studying these kinds of phenomena. Yeah, it's hugely, uh, hugely important. Uh, one of the topics that you touched on there uh, about how a lot of people identify with the, the electro-sensitive uh, 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 pulsing brain in, in, inside of our skull as themselves, whereas a lot of the old, uh, older traditions see the, the brain and the body as secondary uh, vehicles of you know, spirit or the drivers of, of the nature of our desires, etc., um, can you tell us a little bit of some of the experiments that brought you into understanding these as well? Because you, you were the first to, I think, exhibit this, this conscious behavior on experiments in, in what's known as the double slit test. Is that correct? I wasn't the first. The, the first person to do it was a physicist at York University in Canada. Um, but there's a long history, a century of, almost, of people doing similar experiments before that. Uh, all having to do with the nature of mind and matter. So if brain and mind are identical, then it should not be possible that if you direct your attention to something outside your body, that it would do anything. And, I mean, maybe there's some small electromagnetic fields that you could pick up at a distance, but you certainly couldn't change probabilities of events at a distance. So for many years, uh, people have been testing to see what is the role of focused intention in terms of its behavior uh, or its effect on the physical universe. What I've been doing for the last eight or nine years now is one particular type of experiment, which is which I chose because it is particularly relevant to outstanding problems in today's physics. Whereas in a different generation, two generations ago, People were doing things like tossing dice and then saying, can I toss the dice and make numbers come up that I want? 
And that's a perfectly valid experiment. Many experiments were done that did that, use that method. Uh, more recently, people have been using electronic devices called random number generators, where the randomness, like electronic coin flippers, where the randomness was based on some truly random process. And there too, you would have some kind of display. You'd ask somebody to, while the machine is running, to make it produce more heads than tails, for example. And if it turned out that after many, many people, and many runs and many trials and analyses, it turns out that they, they can, they can bias the machine purely through their own intention, well, that's an important thing to know about. <laughs> so I was at uh, Princeton University uh, some years ago, and there's a program at Princeton that ran for almost 30 years where they did that experiment where you have an electronic device producing electronic coin flips, and they assign people to try to get more of one type than another, more heads or tails, and more ones or zeros. And after many years of doing that experiment with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trials, it was statistically extremely clear that they could do that. They wanted to get more ones if it was producing bits, they could do that. If they want more zeros to be produced, they could do that as well. So this is this was at the engineering department at Princeton. They knew what they were doing. They published all of their work. Nobody pays any attention to it. And one of the reasons is that it uh, talk about disruptive. We're talking here about a an ability of the mind of intention to change aspects of the physical world itself. And this is simply through the matter of, of focused attention. It's not, not using anything special other than paying attention to something you push it around. So I took, I, I followed up on the, this long history of different forms of, of target systems to test and I chose an optical double slit system partially because it's a very famous system used in physics to demonstrate that light has characteristics of both waves and particles. But more importantly, that in quantum mechanics, one of the reasons why quantum mechanics is very different than classical physics is because there's the thing called the quantum observer effect. And you can see this very clearly in an optical double slit system because if you know where a photon goes through one slit or the other, if you, if you know that, you can measure it, you can figure it out somehow, it will always behave like a particle. But if you don't know, it'll behave like a wave. It's very easy to, to show that in a physics lab. So what we did that is different than you would see in, an, in a typical physics lab was to, to ask people to use their mind as a detector. To simply imagine that you could tell which of the two slits the photon is going through. So they can't, they're not looking at it with their eye, they're looking at it with their mind's eye and trying to, to see. Well, if it turns out that your mind's eye can do that, that you could see photons at a distance inside a sealed uh, box, then the interference pattern that is produced by this optical system would change, and we know how it would change. So we did eight years of experiments and 17 experiments published, and we saw that, there, that the directing your mind towards that kind of an optical system changes the behavior of light. So, so what up until about a year ago, I said I couldn't say that anybody else had repeated this experiment because there were only a couple that had been done before that. Uh, the, the two experiments that were done before ours, one succeeded and one did not. But recently, a colleague at the University of Sao Paulo, a physicist who was working at CERN, the you know the big uh, hadron collider, yeah. he got interested in this experiment, and so he tried to replicate it, and he ended up doing nine experiments, and he was able to replicate the basic idea of what we were seeing in our experiments. So we now have two independent replications showing that all the way down at the level of quanta, that mind interacts with the physical world. And as I said, this is part of this long, century-long tradition showing again and again, using many different kinds of targets, that the mind and the brain probably are not the same thing. 
Yes, interesting. It, it immediately makes me think about where the, the chain breaks into how much control we can have over um, the, like the ability to do certain things. I've always imagined that a rock kind of remember, it, a rock remembers its space because it, its uh, molecules and particles are in that space and recognized by the other parts of the conscious stream. So it, it leads us into the thought of, well, what, what or where does it break between what we can do with consciousness on a, on a larger scale? So before you started performing some of these uh, scientific or, or psi phenomenon experiments, can you give us a little bit of your uh, personal history or experience that, that, that led you to believe that this stuff was real? Or did you feel, did, were you as baffled by it as some of your colleagues or, or were you uh, ready to dive right into the, the belief or did you continue studies? I think I read too many fairy tales when I was a child, <laughs> right? I mean, if, if you ask a typical child today something about uh, Harry Potter, most of them will have read it. Most of them will have been fascinated by it. Well, I was too when I, when I was a kid. There wasn't Harry Potter then, but it was plenty of other kinds of stories like that. And I, I never forgot my fascination with it. It really was a matter of curiosity. It wasn't as though I had psychic experiences and nobody in my family ever talked about this topic. But I, I guess it, it just sparked my imagination to wonder if these things could be real. And always being interested in science, I, I think I became hooked by the idea when I realized that these were not just things you could take on faith. I mean, if you're lucky, you have these experiences, in which case, th there you go. I mean, you don't need anybody to tell you about them. If you're not lucky, like me, then the only way you can figure out whether it's true or not is to use the methods of science, which is very good for studying these kinds of things, and figure it out for yourself. So in the intervening time from a kid until now is about 50 years or more, uh, I've used methods of science to create experiences for myself in the laboratory to test whether these things are actually true. And so after many years, I've convinced myself that, yeah, people talk about these kinds of experiences, they're not making it up. And it's not that they're mis misremembering it, and it's not fraud, and it's not a bunch of other things. And we know that in principle, that these kinds of phenomena are real. Is some of the abstract conjecture for the, the other tests that didn't, that didn't succeed in, uh, in your, your line of experimentation is could their uh, conscious thoughts about the experiment have actually changed the outcome as well? Does uh, a more open mind to seeing these things allow those experiments to take place? Yeah, so one class of experiments has been done repeatedly for about 70 years. It's called the sheep-goat experiment. And the, the sheep are the people who believe that the phenomena exist, and the goats are the ones who don't believe. And so this idea is checking whether the, the subject's belief makes a difference and also whether the experimenter's belief makes a difference. The hypothesis is that if you take a, a classroom of kids, for example, and they're all going to do exactly the same experiment, you could separate them according to their prior belief. Like how many people believe that this psychic stuff is real, how many people think it's nonsense, separate them into two bins, they all take exactly the same experiment, and you can predict, based on lots of data now, that the believers will get positive results and the skeptics will get negative results. And the difference between their results oftentimes is statistically significant. So as I said, there's 70 years of experiments looking at this in many, many different ways, and it's very clear from that data that this is a robust effect. So if you start with the idea that you think this stuff is nonsense, you either will never experience it, or if you're around other people, they won't experience it either because you tend to infect them. But the flip side is also true. You have somebody who is excited and believes in it, they're more likely to have the experiences. And by the way, that's not just true in this domain, it's true in any psychological domain. Yeah, this, I mean, it's, it's astounding. We had Bruce Lipton on the show a few weeks ago, and it's, it brings a similar kind of chord that our, our belief systems really do structure maybe not only our cellular level, but the potential outer quantum layer of, of what we want to do or what we're capable of achieving in, in life. Um, so when we were reading through your bio, you mentioned that you're, agno uh, you're agnostic on your religious beliefs and you meditate regularly. There, are there any types of meditation that you find um, more valuable or functional, whether it's affirmations, song, or visualization that, that bring uh, these kind of quantum successes in, in your choice of 
um, experimentation or career? I personally use Vipassana, but I've tried many different techniques, and occasionally I'll, I'll listen to a guided meditation. Uh, I think what's most important is, first of all, meditation is very useful for getting yourself into that mental state that's where things happen. Uh, but what's most important for each individual is to simply find something that you'll do, that you'll just practice every day. It, it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as you do something. And by the same token, I know people, we, we have measured lots of people's EEG in the laboratory. And one time uh, we were doing an experiment where we needed people who are long-term meditators. We have a pretty good idea of what we're going to see in their brain waves. And we also needed controls who had never meditated. So we, we set up this one guy and are measuring his brain waves and we're taken aback because he, his brain is behaving a lot like a long-term meditator. So we asked him again, you've, you've never meditated? No, he never meditated a day in his life, but his brain is acting as though he was a long-term meditator. And so we mentioned that to him. He said, well, your, your brain is a lot like long-term meditators. And so he got a, a faraway look in his eye and he said, well, maybe that's why they call me little Buddha at work. <laughs> so here's a, a case of somebody who's just naturally fits into that kind of category that the rest of us may take 20 years to, to reach. And it just points out that people are very different. I mean, we're all the same as humans, but when you look at specific skills that people have, it's completely across the board. Yeah, me meditation from that angle could be so many things. I I've been studying music and composition my most of my life, and I know that's drastically affected the way that I view and interact with the world around me. And so one of the reasons we're asking is that, you know, a lot of people kind of get stuck in this fringe. One of the reasons why I dropped out of school when I was younger is these are the types of questions I was interested in. And I very quickly realized that there was likely no grants or funding or, or any type of school uh, f um, supportive curriculum that I could I could follow in, in life. So um, as you were breaking away from uh, the, what was considered normal and into these more fringe ideas. How did you go about um, funding your uh, your experiments? Did you have to um, abstract the, the the lines to to get grants, or were you able to be uh, very clear with where you're aiming and and still fund your projects? Well, the reason I I left uh, industrial research in places like Princeton is is largely due to actually two things. One is uh, uh, Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, had this phrase to follow your bliss. Like if people, young kids who don't know what they want to do, they, they don't know yet, they haven't tried enough things. So you need to try a bunch of things to find out what you like. But when you find something you're passionate about, in a sense, you have to do that. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be depressed. And so why, why to be depressed all the time? Figure out some way of doing what you like. Now for most people, what you like doing isn't, isn't all that risky. It's extremely risky to do something which is off the beaten trail. But even that, I figured, okay, what I'm doing as a scientist is very risky. It's risky from a financial perspective. It's, it's risky from a credibility perspective, everything you can think of. It's, this is not what scientists do, which is why I'm one of maybe 50 people in the world who are using the tools of science to study these kinds of phenomena. But I decided it was important to follow my bliss. And I'm glad I did because it makes me happy. The other thing is that when you make that decision, you have to be extremely clear about what you think you want to do. <laughs> because if you're not clear, then you, you, don't, you can never have a judge. You never be able to figure out whether or not you've reached the goal. So you, you need to know what the goal is and you need to revise it continually so that you're always clear about it. And I found repeatedly, I mean, people ask me, what's the most amazing psychic thing that I've seen in my career? My answer is my career. Because there is no career. It's, it's like you were saying that there, there's no, when you step out of the conventional, there's no path. There's no career path. There's nothing to tell you what to do. And yet through ex trying to maintain very high clarity about what I wanted, I always found that I could get a position, a paid position, uh, paying me what scientists make and Money somehow appears so I can do this kind of research in lots of different contexts in Silicon Valley, now in a nonprofit and in, in industry. And so that's, that's my magical psychic 
story that clear intention produces things that shouldn't otherwise be and that they and yet it happens brilliant uh, walking your talk seems to be an extremely uh, important metaphor in, in in this sentiment so as your experience uh, in this psychic scientific uh, phenomenon was taking place um, did you see a, a, a growing or a more common acceptance of these findings in the mainstream? Because it seems like there would be a, still a lot of resistance in, to adhere to the fundamental scientific uh, dogmas. Or, you know, is, are there scholarly debates around this type of stuff that take place, or is it still a fairly small niche? It, that depends on, on which week you ask me that question. <laughs> uh, let's put it this way, that... The, the level of, of interest among the general population and, and scientists has always been extremely high. The, the issue revolves around what are we allowed to talk about from a scientific perspective. And so there is a taboo there within the academic world. There's roughly 15,000 institutions of higher learning. Among them, about 40 of these institutions talking about mainstream universities, have at least one faculty member who's known for having a, an active interest in this topic. So 40 people out of 15,000 institutions is not a very large amount when you consider that over 90% of people have some kind of interest in this. I mean, you can get a PhD in by studying uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> it, all kinds of things in the popular domain are acceptable in the academic world to get a degree. It is not acceptable to get a degree in this topic, except if your interest is why do people believe in these phenomena without saying anything about whether they're true, simply whether they believe it. So even people who are professionals in the domain of religious studies, and in religion, psychic and mystical phenomena are like the core of the whole topic. They are not allowed to suggest that the phenomena are real. You can't do it. So, 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 what do you do with all of that? My my decision in this case was, well, this is just stupid. I mean, there are some taboos that are stupid, especially in the academic world where we have supposedly have academic freedom to study what we think is important to study. That is simply not true. There are some things you are not allowed to study if if you want to maintain a job. So I got out of that system and out of the industrial system as well because they're, they, they really only want you to work on what they want you to work on, not what you want to work on, uh, and, and you blaze your own path, basically. And in some respects, you, if the world is responding by saying, okay, this is a, you can make a viable living doing this regardless of how strange it is, then I take that as a sign that what I'm doing is important to something, someone, somewhere. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I think it's astounding that the, the direction that a lot of this stuff is taking, at least from my perspective, um, really uh, insinuates that even if the you're, you have to kind of tell yourself you're happy or that you're going to be successful, that these are the drivers for uh, a better society at large, too, because it kind of can diminish the, the these almost ab abhorrent uh, fears that are, you know, uh, flying through the universe and what might happen next that we might actually be consciously in control of, as a society, of, of what happens to us on this rather perilous trail. Um, so just as a, a side thought here, um, are there other um, supporting uh, you know, scientists in, in your field that are doing um, other uh, psychic uh, experiments? Sure, yeah. There, as I said, there's around 40 people around the world, most in university settings, who are actively engaged in these kinds of experiments. <clears throat> There's probably a couple of thousand academics, so meaning scientists and scholars, who are actively interested, but they're not doing experiments at the moment. Um, and in your earlier question was, uh, ha what is happening in terms of changes in the fads and fashion within science? In other words, will this eventually become mainstream or not? I think it will become mainstream. Because when you look at the history of science, every major breakthrough was always considered not part of the mainstream. It, every, every major breakthrough of any type, any disruption, is always going to challenge the status quo. And it is, by, almost by definition, it is pushed to the fringe because the status quo doesn't like to change very much. 
So the, the reason why I think that things are changing is partially because uh, in order for these kinds of phenomena to be better accepted, the scientific worldview itself has to change. In fact, the, re the reason why these phenomena are not well accepted is because it does challenge basic ideas within the scientific worldview. By that, I mean that there are certain ideas that we simply take for granted, usually are, are not even examined very in very great depth, that scientists are taught about, and scholars, and it becomes the engine of assumptions that, that drive society and, and our daily lives. Philosophers pay a lot of attention to these assumptions, but there aren't that many philosophers out there either, and hardly anybody pays any attention to them except other philosophers. So eventually the scientific worldview will change because it has always changed. That's why we keep changing the textbooks every 20 years. It's an evolutionary process. It's just difficult to see it because it's a little bit slow. So are we changing in a direction where eventually something like telepathy will be seen as, oh yeah, it's just, it's just that thing. You know, we understand it now. It's not strange, it's part of the mainstream. Is that gonna happen? I think it will happen. And so the evidence I have for that is First of all, the kinds of articles that we're publishing are slowly beginning to show up in more and more mainstream journals, which means that there's younger editors who don't have the old prejudices that their, their bosses used to have, who are more open to these kind of phenomena. I think largely brought about because of uh, the development of quantum mechanics. Because when you start looking at the picture of reality that is painted by quantum mechanics, it is radically different than there are everyday worldview, which is basically cl classical mechanics. It is so radically different that uh, up until maybe 20 years ago, almost nobody was talking about the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Like what does it mean to have a world where there's no objects and things are potentials and not actuals and all these kinds of concepts. Now more and more young physicists and uh, young scientists in many domains are beginning to wonder well, what does this actually say about the nature of reality? And it has huge implications for our understanding of reality. And what's important is that those changes are exactly what's required in order to eventually develop a scientific underpinning for these kinds of experiences that we're talking about. Probably the single most important part of it is the notion of non-locality. That means non-locality is referring to connections that transcend space and time. That's one of the strangest aspects of quantum mechanics and has been theoretically predicted and experimentally demonstrated again and again. So some aspect of reality has non-local connections. Well, guess what? That is the only reason why psychic phenomena seem strange. It's experiences that transcend space and time. So I don't think it's a coincidence that as physics has looked deeper and deeper into the nature of reality, it has found the kind of physical world that is necessary in order to sustain the kinds of experiences that people have talked about as psychic and as mystical. So a lot of it seems like it would be uh, of a huge importance to uh, governments or, or militaries. Uh, to, they were studying this type of stuff back um, back to the early 1900s and 1960s. Do you know of any of the, the research that still goes on today or, or government research that's been uh, used I guess in this field at all? Well, in terms of, of research that was used from the 1970s or the 1990s, there was a US government program. Uh, it was top secret, so nobody knew about it at the time, but now it's mostly declassified and that program is using highly adept psychics for espionage. And we know that the Russians had a similar program and we suspect that the Chinese did as well. So that most of that work ended in the late 1990s, early 2000s. We don't know, at least I don't know at this point, whether it's continuing because I'm not part of that program anymore. That's, that's fair. This was a part of the, you worked with these programs in, um, in, in the early 1990s and into the 2000s? I was on the, the U.S. government program in the mid-1980s. Um, brilliant. Is, so, and that's declassified information now? Most of it, yeah. Um, what was the what was the title uh, of their operations? Well, it had many code words used o over the years. The, the one that's probably best known is called Stargate. That was just a code word, uh, and it was 
a, both a research side, which is trying to understand how do these phenomena work, by phenomena mostly remote viewing, clairvoyance essentially, uh, and then a, an operational side. The U.S. Army had a team of talented remote viewers who were given operational tasks to the psychically spy, essentially. Wow, that's a, a brilliant thought to, to lead out from. So we were basically, both you and I agree that we're all psychic and, and the ability to kind of nurture these um, phenomenon in individuals might be actually kind of stubbed from early ages. What's your thoughts about uh, the development of, of children and uh, um, these maybe the staunch reality of kind of being told, oh, none of this stuff is real, you're in, in the make-believe. Are children more, uh, uh, generally more capable of, of these psychic uh, phenomenon or, or able to actually use them or demonstrate them properly? There was a, one long-term studying study looking at uh, children from ages 3 to 18. And so uh, children in each age group were tested. And these were just, just children from schools and stuff, not specially selected to see if there was an age where people are just naturally more psychic than others. And a very clear outcome was about age four. So age four is interesting from a developmental point of view because it's at a stage where they still live in a, a, a very uh, fantasy-driven world, but they're beginning, their language is developing, their social skills are developing, and, and they're, they're able to express what their experience is like. After about age four, when they start to become much more socialized, they learn very quickly that you don't talk about your imaginary friends. Hmm. You don't talk about things that you know, visions and whatever. It's not socially acceptable to talk about, except in some rare families where it's encouraged. So the, and those kinds of kids who are say, it's okay to talk about this to us, you may not want to talk to your friends about this or have selected friends where you can. Well, they as adults will tend to maintain those abilities, these natural abilities. For other people who learn don't talk about this, they will forget it quickly. By the time they're six or seven, it's gone. It's never completely gone. It's a better way of, of explaining it is that it's suppressed. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's a skill of any kind needs needs nurturing uh, and, and compassion to believe in because often skills are, can be quite uh, painful to have too. A, bl a blessing and a curse, I think, is the the sentiments from from that function do so are, are the children more able to clearly demonstrate uh, rem remote viewing then uh, at a younger age well we don't know because it's much more difficult to work with children in the laboratory than it is with adults right it, it's both more difficult from uh, from a legal perspective <laughs> there are constraints and what what you can do uh, but it's also difficult in that children's attention spans are pretty short so there are plenty of people doing studies with children, but not of the sort that we're interested in. Right. So we, we haven't done any studies involving children other than just informally. And I would say that informally, yes, children are usually much better than adults because they don't know yet what they're not supposed to be able to do. That's fair. You, the, the limitations of mind yet aren't in place. Um, so uh, the last two questions are kind of abstract ones. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones is one I like to ask. One of them is actually from a, a Bear family member. Um, they want to get your thoughts on this so-called Mandela effect where uh, large groups of people are, are, are strongly or adamantly believing that this uh, character of events from the past has, has changed now in the, in the future from song lyrics of, uh, I believe, like, we are, we are the champions, uh, people remembering hearing of the world, this kind of thing. Do you have any, any thoughts of this kind of what I considered a mass hallucination? <laughs> yeah, I certainly have heard of this. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I think it's uh, part of it is that we're exposed to so much information now on, on the internet uh, that you don't need you don't need to change things very much in order for lots of people to start seeing things that turn out to be slightly different than the way that it was historically. Uh, historically, some song lyrics you either couldn't understand, so people would make up other lyrics, or the, the lyrics didn't quite make sense, so somebody else made up a better lyric and so on. So it's very easy for information to get all mashed up, hmm. uh, given that it, there's a million different ways of, of getting to the same kind of information. 
So the idea of memes, of course, has become a meme itself, that there, it's as though I, certain concepts take on a life of their own. And so depending on, on how old you were when you first encountered the meme and what you think about those ideas, I can easily see how this is not something spooky, but simply a matter of how collective memory works. Yeah, interesting. It was uh, one of the things I thought too is that we're uh, the way we remember things is it can be so watery unto itself. And then my last question, and in no way a serious question, just a kind of a more personal one: um, What do you think your spirit animal is? <laughs> uh, somebody asked me that the other day, and I immediately said a, a red fox. A red fox. Yeah. And I have no idea where that came from. I mean, I, I wasn't thinking really about any animal, and I don't even know much about a red fox. I know that it was the name of a comedian, but no, I had an image of a fox that was kind of had red hair. Brilliant, intelligent creatures, great at hunting, um, and have a, a immaculate smell. Um, Dean, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. I know that uh, you've got a book coming up in, in April, uh, so we'll, we'll make sure we have you back on, on for the re release of your new book. Um, right. I, I want to say thank you from all the Bear family for sharing this, uh, the kind of repeating idea of how we are consciously controlling our story, not just as individuals, but a, a species, I think is um, ever increasingly important as we go into potentially these more perilous times um, and be, can, can be the solution instead of the problems. Um, with that in mind, give us those thumbs up, ladies and gentlemen. It helps other people later on down the stream find the information yes. they're looking for. Um, all the... The links to, to Dean Radin's information, the books he's got for sale, we'll have those down below. Um, again, thank you for your time, Dean, and, we, and we'll, we'll see you back here in the future. Thank you.